is um, probably the foremost scholar of Persian literature in India today. And I'll talk a little bit about his many accomplishments. But one of his accomplishments that's very relevant to me is that I learned a lot of Persian from him sitting in his office in Delhi University. And it materially contributed to my ability to do any work at all. So it's a great pleasure to welcome my teacher, who also happens to be um, uh, perhaps, as I said, the foremost scholar of Persian literature in India today. Um, he has published an endless number of books, beginning, of course, um, with the translation of the Murakai Dehli uh, early. But then after that, also many, many Persian texts uh, from the entire range of Persian language and history in South Asia. So I believe your PhD work was on um, Amir Khusro. But uh, from then onwards, from the 13th century to the 19th and possibly 20th century, is an area of Professor Chandrasekhar's um, um, expertise. I'll mention, I'd like to mention some of the very important works um, that uh, Professor Chandrasekhar has published. They include, for instance, the Miratul Istila of Anand Ram Mukhlis, which is an encyclopedic dictionary. Um, the Madhu al Afkar, um, which is a uh, work of uh, insha and collected writings. Uh, the Waqai Asad Beg Kazvini, um, and many other texts, many other texts and translations. And I will forgive you for not knowing the names of these texts. And that is because they are not the standard works of Mughal history, but these are new texts that historians have traditionally not seen. These are important works that historians have traditionally not encountered. And in fact, Professor Chandrasekhar is a, a you know, unstoppable force of nature in traveling across archive to archive, uncovering texts of primary importance for South Asian history and making them available to scholars. Um, of course, with his own critical commentary, which has made that interpretable in the first place. Most recently, he was the director of the Indian Cultural Center in Uzbekistan uh, for the last several years, um, where he also accomplished a great deal. And we're looking forward to the great discoveries of manuscripts and texts that you will bring to us from there. So it's really a very great pleasure to welcome you to my university, to our university, and uh, culminate a series of conversations that we've been having over the last couple of days about Persian texts and manuscripts, um, and to hear your talk today. So with that, please join me in welcoming about whom I read a number of works and all senior teachers of UC, thanks to Punita who managed to bring me here to all the coordination. Some of my students who were at JNU and DUT who were also present and became in fact, uh, whatever I have a source and the force behind is these students. I'm not a historian, very frankly. But work on the text of history written in Persian. And due to these students, I read, write, and edit the text, which I feel these should be available to every research scholar so that they can study as a primary source. So, present work is also based on my some recent edition. Uh, one is uh, this uh, Vishik Vanshan, Vakaya Sadek Kazrini, which is referred by a number of historians, but the text had not come out. It has almost six manuscripts, and the base manuscript is in Asafia, which is to be almost from late 17th century. I had given the complete detail of every manuscript, and I had uh, gave this book and the other one to Abhishek so that 
students and others who are interested, they can take benefit of this one because these are you know, from online sources. This is an interesting text. Uh, my rival teacher, Prasam Muzaffar Alam, is so Ramanim also updated it briefly in English. But he too had not used the source manuscript, which is from the Asafi Library, Hyderabad. And there are many editions in there which have not come into the translation which they have done it. But it was also Professor Alam who asked me to do work on this one. During uh, editing of this text and others, certain uh, aspects came to my notice that I this is on this one I am presenting my interpretation of certain things. The other one is the Gulshan is Sade. It is also interesting uh, from the methodology point of view that there are many works which has two copies of the manuscripts. Sometimes scribed by the same Munshi or same copy. At least uh, four such examples I can give. Like one is this Majmaul of Kar, which Vishak just mentioned. It has two copies, one in British Library and the other in Polish Library. Both are scribed in Kanada in the same time, ending in the same, same scribe. Similarly, Gulshan Sade of Shakir Khan, about whom we will speak, uh, discuss the same. It also has two copies. Uh, initially, there were about 1,200 folios. Uh, this Majmal of Kar also has about 800 folios. Two volumes which I edited has more than, I think, 1,600 pages. And in those days, digital copies were not available. And I spent almost seven years. The reason is every year I used to go there, sit there, and then take note of that. Thanks to my daughter who was studying at BIT, Mesra, and it was a point of me that I would get down at Patna and work there, and then just go to meet her for a day or two, and then come back to Pune. So this Majmal of Kar or Gushan Sadiq both had two copies. Similarly, uh, two copies of Kalila or Dimna. One is in Rampur, other is in Florence. Same scribe, Sultan Muhammad bin Nura from the 1502. I published its uh, facsimile for ICCR New Delhi in 2016. Very beautiful manuscript with more than 90 illustrations of uh, Hirat school. Majaris was shark. Two copies, one is Rampur, other is Tashkan I found. Very interesting. And there is a manuscript which has even an image of Amir Khosla. Very rare such this. So, the majority of some renowned works, like one I edited in 2011, it is a Chahar Gulshan, which has important manuscript, uh, maps from South India till Balkh. That is uh, because uh, the maps are used by the Britishers. That is the first work uh, from the cartographic point of view, which has large number of all type of uh, water bodies, forts, forests, or even the milestones. These are given in these maps. There are 12 maps showing what are the roads leading towards from south to north. And the work is used by a number of people in his time and later, especially the Britishers. Even Professor Ivanovi has used the AMU library manuscript, or there is British library manuscript also, and Jagannath Sarkar also translated in India of Aurangzeb. He used this Khudarosh library. But more important manuscript later we found in National Museum, New Delhi. So these are sources which are used by many people across administration or in other sources, we found 
different copies, but in many cases we found two copies only of your work. So this is an interesting task from the point of view of the uh, masculinity that how it comes that the two copies at the same time or the first copy as I said about this uh, Gushan Sadiq is made and then some uh, changes were made at the last moment. The same is in this Majmoor uh, Afkar also. Every partner's landscape is richer though in the same style. Uh, today we are just discussing how the projection of self I by writers. It may be in different languages. It is not the Persian only. Because uh, always the writers want an identity and the recognition. Either it's today or it was in the past. It is not a new thing. But how they are depicting themselves, that is interesting. Every person wants an identity and recognition, definitely. And even some of them want identity for not only for themselves but for the whole ethnic group. I hope people will not mind to listen one verse of the Saadi when he says Gar kehtur rijal bashad basekas un samajib awal afghani urdu um kamboji or sivum bagda kashmiri. But he forget about all Iranians that either all Iranians are very much here. And as we say in proverb in Hindi, uh, no uh, sweet maker or curd seller says that his curd is so. So we usually find lacunas in others, but we forget that we are also th one thrown out of paradise for having apple, as everyone had it. So whether it is Saadi or someone else, uh, we pick up things in others, not in ourselves. But we want recognition and the identity that way. The Indo-Persian corpus to be fine for study of various disciplines, reveal variety of trends and personalities of the writers and poets existed and projected in their writing. If you find Indo-Persian writers, uh, of a variety of texts projecting themselves with a lofty self-projection by affixing variety of titles and adjectives with their names. Though in many cases we'll find addressing ourselves Heech Madan, Khake Paye Shoma, or in Tajiki Persian, Kamine Shoma. So all are showing with all humility to themselves. Even some Indian poets like Munir Lahori claim that the poets and writers arrived from Persian speaking areas were just compilers of the words void of poetics, especially no deep rooted sustainable meaning in their verses to compare uh, in compare to Indian poets who had poetry in their genes and ways since unknown times and citing Vedas. On the other hand, the poets like Kofi Shirazi and his followers were presenting uh, new subjects and calling their innovativeness in poetry as the new waves of fresh speaking or fresh ideas projected through the poetry, calling it Taza Gui. Through this, they were challenging the authority of the established schools of Persian poetry, even those by Iranians back to their homeland and also to those who are having vintage points for their traditional poetry and earning laurels at the royal courts in the modern, early modern India. Study of various texts written in Persian being the language of elite and court writing reveal how much the writers were in quest and conscious of the projection of self in their writing. In literary, either prose or poetry both, Text as well as the text written for the record of political, economic, or even in some cases, social cultural history, the said phenomena they found in common. The detail of self projection provides variety of the shades of the personality of the writer or poet, as well as educated person belonging to elite family or having connection from the early childhood royal family or having protection of royalty in his profession. Asad Beg 
of Vakai Asabi Kavini may be put into this framework. It is variously referred to in manuscripts and secondary sources as Vakai Asabi Kavini or Risalai Asabi Kavini or Tarikhe Asabi Kavini or Ehwale Asabi or even Halate Asabi. It is a self recorded chain of events by Ewadullah Asad bin Muhammad Murad Zakani, popularly known as Asad bin Kazvini. Zakan is a place near to Kazvin, referred only in the base manuscripts of Asafir library. Other people who have translated or referred it, including the one edition from Tehran by Noruzi, he could not read the word Zakan and he made it Rakan, but not giving any geographical situation of it. At a very young age, he left for Herat, the Khorasanian Sufit gubernatorial court of Ali Kuli Khan Shamlu, also known as Haji Ali Tagal Bash Mazandrani, who was also the tutor of Shah Abbas the Great. There he joined the court of Khaja Afzal, the wazir as uh, Khaja Afzal, as is the Wadda, but soon he migrated from there to the Mughal court at Agra. However, there is no available information about the exact timing of his joining the Mughal court, but he would have definitely joined the Mughal court prior to 1585, as he stated that he served Sheikh Abul Fazl for 17 years. How or by whom he was introduced to Sheikh Abul Fazl is not known, except Tazkarai Mahkana states that he was a poet and known as Asad Sheikh Abul Fazl. Fortunately, I could find Asad Beg's Diwan in British Library, India of his collection, entitled as Diwan Asad. Asad Beg realizes his master in <coughs> one of his kasida in the following manner. Uh, please tell me, should I read the Persian text or should just I avoid? Sheikh Abul Fazl Aang Te Dastu Dilash Dar Atao Sakha Tu Behru Baras Anche Dar Kainat Mojudas Wa Anche Az Mankinat Motwaras Taz e Fayzi Tu Behre Yabad Akhl Tun Aftaf Dar Bedaras Dar Zamane Tu Be Name Tu Bad Is a Name Tu Fazl Nam Baras If he gets himself named as Asad Beg Abul Fazli Amin Razi in his half Taklim and Taji Odin Arafatul Ashakin have elogized the personal and poetic characteristics of Asad Beg. The anthology writer of Sakina Khoshgo of Bindraban Das Khoshgo, who has cited some of his verses as specimen of his poetic skill and has emphasized the innovativeness of his poetry. His whole narrative goes around self projection to establish his close proximity to the, to the Emperor Akbar on the basis of his rise from a renowned family of Kazvin, according to Khan Ardu, Asad Beg was a close family member of Asif Khan, whose court Asad had joined, and the name of his father was Murad Beg Aga Molai. Unlike Johar Sarchi, who was asked by Edward to compile uh, his memoirs of his services, a period of 25 years, which he rendered to Humayu, the book entitled Taskrit al it is not found that this Avakai Asad Beg Kazvini was written at the behest of any royalty or nobility or who asked him to compile it as he does not give any hint or evidence in the inner content. Even the accurate time of the compilation is also not known. Yes, on the basis of the inner evidences, it may be ascertained that the collected material would have been put into a form of book much later. It covers the events from the time of assassination of Abul Fazl to the ascension of the Prince Salim as Jahangir. After a brief traditional preamble, usually found in the traditional Persian text, begin with the conversation going on between the Emperor Akbar and the Grandis present in the court discussing the issue of assassination of Abul Fazl, where he was assassinated. From other sources, we know that Abul Fazl was sent to Deccan with a military assignment when Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan as well as Prince Daniel could not contain Adil Shahid. In 604, Abul Fazl was on his way back as Abdul summoned him. The exigency of return was due to Prince Slim's non acceptable behavior to Akbar. At the time of return, Prince Slim was at Allahabad. When 
Abdul reached Sarunj, a big was with him, where he was left behind by Abdul Fazl with the force of the king's soldiers while he himself moved ahead. Despite the author's sincere advice to carry more force, Abdul Fazl moved on with a few faithful soldiers. The description reveals or emphasizes his close proximity to Abdul Fazl. Again, self projection. He also states that it was Abul Fazl who rushed us, that is, introduced him to Akbar personally. He even explains that uh, though Akbar had much liking for him and even wanted him to keep in his own court, but he did not want to annoy Abul Fazl during the lifetime of the letter. It is for this reason that he was called Asad Abul Fazl. At the Agra court, in the course of dialogue and conversation on the assassination of Abul Fazl, suddenly Akbar, according to Asad Beg, very worryingly asks about his welfare, inquires about his whereabouts and safety from grandees who were present at the court at that time. Persian text says, Chum khabare an waqai haile wan kazi na guzi be hazrat e khakan e azam zil e ilahi akbar shahi rasid besyar mutasir o mutfakir be ghaib mutalim o manadi shuda. Chananche an ruz wa an shab, this sentence must be taken care. Chananche an ruz wa an shab be mutab saresh wa afyum ne pardakhtam wa madar be zari o sovwari dud. Baki Mirbani and Balchai Jamjara Azim Tawan Malum Namut, that Isnaye An Azurdigi O Gamnaki Azuri Nihayat Zare Parveri Be Fikre Raki Maharufusta. As an Azikan Posidan, Ke Asad Keshudibu, Chun Hadran Raz Ewale in Shikaste Bal Kabri Namut, Jawab Mutavaki Nedadan, Kedar Hamin Wat, Mirza Jafar Bil Asif Khan Mirasad. Chun an Hazrat Ra Dar Nihayat Anudu Naki Wa Azurdi Mushayad E Namud Be Akhtiyar Shuru Dar Giriye Mi Namayad Wa An Hazrat Dar An Waq Az Umi Kusan Ke Asad Che Khabar Dari Ke Amra Bud Ya Na Bud Wa An Khan Ali Shan Baad Az Rase Salaab E Mishgaan Be Arz E Ashraf Aghdas Mi Rasanad Ke Asad Beg Ta Siron Hamra He also stated that Akbar in that sorrowful state had not taken his, on that day, he has not taken the dose of opium and sarish, another form of narcotics. Imagine Akbar was lamenting and in sorrowful state of the, on the assassination of his closest aide Abul Fazl, who was not only his general but a close advisor too, the one who through his father Sheikh Mubarak got him authority on all religious matters and the title of Imam Adil through getting a Mazar Nama signed by the Grand Muftis and highly positioned clergy class and theologians and in such a grave circumstances, Akbar is worried about Asad Bek Kazim, a man with no true life. <laughs> Akbar to the above text on Akbar's query, Jafar Beg Asif Khan, a noble of high rank, explained that Asad was left at Saron, so he is safe, but the emperor, according to Asad, was not satisfied with his reply. Hence he asked Jafar Khan to take a dictation to scribe a form immediately. Asad exhibits from this line that emperor dictated the text of the Farman to a grandee, not to a Munshi. The Farman or the royal decree was scribed immediately by Asif Khan and His Majesty put his Ozut seal, the royal seal, on it and handed over to a special messenger, Mia Gada, to be delivered to Asad Beg, asking him to leave everything in the charge of Gopal Das and rush to the court. Persian text says, Hazrat Haman Zaman by Asif Khan ni farmayan ke hamin ya be nashin wa be khat te khud farmani be nabis be asad ke tamam mardu me marhumi e shekhra pishay gopal das dar sarun guzash se khud wa jamaay te khudash be ilgar be rasan Asif Khan Hasbul Hok Ashraf Hasbul Hok me Ashraf Haman ya nishas te farmane wala bhi nui sad wa be mohre uzuk rasa ni de an Hazrat Mia Gadar at Talbi de be umi dahan ke boro be Baradre Kubede, Tadar Saron, Be Asad Berasan, Wa Ura Ba Jamaite, Hodash Hamra Bi Alay. After this statement, Asad Bek picturizes the event which led to the assassination of Abul Fazl, people who were with him, and the arrival of Bir Singh Bandela, who first had conversation with the former, that is Abul Fazl, 
Abul Fadl used harsh words for Prince Selim during the conversation and B. Singh uh, Bundela first warned him not to be a district towards his master, that is Jangi, but Abul Fadl did not restrain him and consequently B. Singh thrusted a spear in his neck and his escort murdered Abul Fadl as escort also. Only Gopal Das, also mentioned as a Gopal Das Nakta, escaped the scene and was only witness of the event and he could take out one big trunk which Abul Fadl was carrying from Deccan with him. He handed over the same uh, trunk to Asad Bek. Asad Bek laments Elias Abul Fadl had accepted his uh, Alas, uh, Abul Fadl had accepted his request to take him with him and also strong force but the latter did not pay heed to his request. After receiving the Farman, he proceeds to Agra with few people and on his way he meets Rai Chand Bakshi of Abul Fadl who had already moved to Kalabad as an advance party. After arrival in Agra along with 60 or 70 people enters the court and gets entry into the special enclosure with 5-6 people only. On getting information about his presence there, Akbar was first in a very mournful state, comes into room to see Asad Bey, and even started crying, remembering Abul Fazl. But suddenly, then he exhorted Asad Bey, asking where he was in those circumstances, why he did not accompany Abul Fazl, and in result, his gross dereliction of the duty, his close friend was assassinated. Akbar pronounced, Bring Asad Bek to the Ghosl Khana, the private chamber where he will cut him into pieces so that it becomes a lesson for all others. Asad Bek, apart from his reply through Ramdas Kashwaha, adds that it will be an honor for him if the emperor executes him himself, <laughs> again a sign of importance for himself. Persian says, An Hazrat Kitchenin Ashwat Bashan Che Bigwe, Shuma Bhitar Nidanid, An Chidanid. A chariot, a fakir, their honors, Rafti Begui, to Ramdas. Wa digar ishan badsha ay adilan. Khuda ne khaste bashad ke kasira na haj bikushan. Agar bikushan ham che chare, man hezar bar, jane khudra sarf rahe ishan namude, badushmanan ishan hame jad karde basham, hargiz al bin a murdan, wa kushan mulaize ne karde basham. As in Kudam Saadat Betar Kahadbud, Kebavad Kichunin Kushte Shavam Bedraste in the Mudra. Afrasif Khan and Farid Khan convinced the Emperor about Asad Beg's justified statement. Akbar allowed him to return to his house and his family. It was only he among the servants of Abul Fazl who was retained in the service and permitted to be present direct, uh, in direct service of the Emperor Akbar that too in the close enclosure, the katera, in the court and the jaroka, the special window from which the emperor used to give audience to his subjects, again his own projection as a very important personality. He is asking Ramdas Kachwaha Akbar, See how emperor is concerned about his family also. Means he is the only one whom Akbar is accepting. Before leaving the court, Emperor again summons him, allows him to put a kiss on his feet, puts his hand on his head, and inquires of his place of belonging or from where he hailed from, or from where his Jafar Khan provides full information on his behalf about his lineage and length with Kazim. Emperor expresses happiness knowing that he is the relative of Jafar. Chum Fari Shudam Hadrat Vishek Fari Famudan KBR Asadra Kepayema Debusa Ma An Hadrat Sadebudan Pakira Urde the Pai Hadrat Andar Pai Mavarak Hadrat Rabusi An Hadrat 
ہم شدہ دست مبارک را پشت فقیر دو سے مرتبے مقرر رسا نظم چنانچہ اثر بیت اس چہرے مبارک شان ظاہر ہو چونس پائی گوس پارک شد استاد حضرت فرمودن کہ اصد اس کجا ہست و اس چھے مردم ہست نقیب خان بے عرض رسانید کہ اصد بے از مردم خوب خزوین ماس حضرت بے فقیر متوجہ شدگم فقیر اشارے بے عاصف خان کر کہ شام بہتر نہیں دارا عاصف خان کی شرطے بے عرض رسانید کہ اصد بے خیش نزدی کے ماس خیش ریلیٹی پیدر اور امراد بے آگا مولائی بھی گوئین و از مردم معتبر خوب خزوین آن حضرت فرمودن کہ تو خیش عاصف خان بودے ہی و ما غافر We were not aware that you are related. Therefore, he endeavors to establish his strong links with the nobility of higher rank, like Jafar Khan and Sheikh Farid, while till that time he was not conferred upon any rank. But he was successful in making a space for himself in the royal court. Asad Beg exhibits the whole circumstance in which he was known a rank of Yesado Do Bisti, that is 125, on the confirmation of his family relationship with Asif Khan. As approved by Nakib Khan, he was positioned as a protocol officer in the group entitled Yathak in inner circle where his duty was to communicate about the audience, the people who seek the audience of the emperor. It was hardly three to four months then he was picked up by the emperor himself in place of Sheikh Abul Khair, brother of Sheikh Abul Fazl, to investigate whether any negligence took place during the siege of the fort of Irch which was taken over by Bir Singh Gundela, the assassination of Sheikh Abul Fazl as his shelter. Imagine, brother of Sheikh Abul Fazl was not appointed, he was appointed as an inquiry officer. Asad Beg investigates the matter and found that no one was deliberately responsible for the escape of Bir Singh. Thus, he earned pleasure of the Malwa region since all the involved parties were given a clean sheet in the inquiry report submitted by him. The reports to submit states in a language which hurts no one. Again, a crafty or piece of statecraft of court politics. Asad Beg does not reveal any link of Prince Slim in the assassination or rather knowingly keeps the report language away from any involvement. After a short stint at the Agra court, he was assigned the task of Ilchi for submitting a stern message to Sultan Adil Shah II and to hand over his daughter, who was wedded with Mughal Prince Daniel, but the said Adil Shahi kept her de daughter deliberately in his kingdom at the border, Mangalbira. Abdurrahim Khan Khanan, who could not speak, seek success on this issue. Then Jamaluddin Hussain Inju, the renowned lexicographer of Karanje Jangiri, was sent and he also stationed there, could not do anything. So Sultan Adil Shah II was successful one as a diplomat. Asad Beg in the description of the said assignment and from his stay projects self, showing himself a very honest person, his acquired proximity to Sultan Adil Shah II, who was known as a Jagat Guru also, his meeting with the Sultan, the musical assemblies of the Bijapur Empire, new city, Norris, gifts assigned for the Mughal Emperor, efforts of Bijapuri noble to corrupt Asad Beg, so he skips from his main task of getting uh, Mankuha, daughter of Sultan Adil Shah, who was stationed at the border of Bijapur and Mughal Empire. The success of Asad Beg in getting the said daughter from Mangal Vira to cross over to her husband, that is Prince Dalian, and in the description of his achievements, Asad even labels Abdul Rahim khan -e Khanan and Jamaluddin Hussain Inju as the corrupt nobles who were accepting bribes from Sultan Adil Shah II. Perhaps this is the only work where straight away Abdul Rahim khan -e Khanan has been labeled as a corrupt noble. The whole description of arranging of gifts by Bijapur Sultan for Agra reveals the soft diplomatic channel. The gifts were arranged as per the status, which include the precious diamonds and famous elephant chanchal, many other elephants, 
horses of Arab and Central Asian state and other material, painting of those elephants, especially chanchal, uh, were made by the Mughal court painters. And it is said that even during elephant fight, it was the elephant fight which exhausted Akbar and became a cause of his death, as Vakai Asad Bekkarini said. Though Asad was trying to show himself incorruptible, he could not control himself at one time when the gifts were being given and asked in a very subtle manner to uh, Lanku Pandit that a suitable gift must be given for him to He returns to Agra and reports the successful visit and hands over all the gifts to the royalty. The text provides a beautiful description of the Bijapuri buildings, market full of local and foreign products. Asad Bek too acquires a variety of precious stones. He names each and every precious stone and ornament made of pure gold. And for comparing the rates, the, he also sends his people to the market to purchase certain precious ornaments for himself. Interestingly about the aspects on economy, he also informed that the said Sultan sent a huge amount of the currency lari uploaded on the camels. Initially the said currency was from Luristan, moved to Georgia, where still the name of the currency is lari and Bijapur adopted this silver hairpin size, hairpin size currency for their state too. Before returning to Agra, Asad Bey was received by Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan and Prince Daniyan at Ahmednagar. Again, the right projects himself a very important person. He says that the prince inquired about his travel expenses from a, from Khane Khanan, though he was informed that Asad had ample amount, but still, for his dignity, he was given another 5,000, and Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan was asked to send his elder son, Rustam, to accompany him till the border. In his own special feast full of decking cuisine was arranged. About uh, this, about text in Persian, Kane Khanan Hamdust ke bhi takalus in khidmat ra asad bek bisya khub kar waz rui ye himmat aur sar chishmi be taqdim rasanir ma khabar darim ke dar ibtada do lakh khun kabul mi kardan ke do ul bedahan wa azu naam e rukhsat e ruzay awal ne girad wa u in maani ra asal kabul ne kard wa in dalil nihayat e himmat e us chune in mukadamat khate nishan shahzad e shor for Mudan ke de hezar rupee ke anche dar amadane asad bek dade budin baaz baedar wa haman zaman de hezar rupee dar bist khan karde akhme fagib fiskar means another 10,000 who were placed in the uh, 20 trays and were sent for him. On his return, Jamaluddin Hussain Inju also set forth to return to Agra. In the description, one may observe the courtly competition among the nobility. Asad Beg was advised by his well-wisher, especially again and again he mentioned Ramdas Kashwaha at the Agra court to reach prior to Inju. Knowing the importance to reaching prior to Inju and handing over the royal gifts, especially the elephant chanchal to Akbar, will get him much reward. He hastened his camp towards Agra. Though Inju sent his complaints to against him, and he was a very senior noble in compared to Asad Beg, but still the complaints were not allowed to be communicated to the emperor by the friendly courtiers of Asad Beg. Persian says, Say ye fazir in bhut ke pishtar azmir jamaluddin hussain be darbar be rasad wa in feel rabbe rasanad ke mujai ye fazir be waagai shavad chananche ramdas wa aksar dustan az darbar mukarrar mi nashtan means he did not allow him to take charge of the elephants gifted by Sultan Azil Shah. Asad Beg as per his Manoeuvring strategy helped by the noble Ramdas reached prior to Inju, he presented all the gifts to the emperor. The description of presentation is given as here. Vakte Kube Arze Ashraf Rasanide Bishar Mustahsan Namud Vaduze Digar 
ان کمزرین جان سپار در وقت درشن دوپہری خدر بے دربار رسانید اور بے وسیلے راجہ رامداز مہربان بے سجدے آستان محدد رسیدے سر گلند گردید و چہرے غبار علو خدر از زمین بور سے درگاہ بہشت آئین شست شست شو دادے آبرو یہ تازے اندو دست نخست نظر بور یہ کونچی یہ نفیس از ذرہائی مسکوت غیر متعرف کہ یہ خون نورس و نو عدد خون دیگر و نو ابراہیمی و نو کسرے و نو سکی نورس و نو نارجیل و نو لاری بو چون بے نظر اشرف اغزت درامد بسیار خوش آمدے بے ہمی و رسیدے و ازہری قصیدن و چون سکی نورس بے نظر در آمد از آن سب سار رفت بے عرض رسانید کہ عادل خان نو خون دکن را یک خون کردے و بے ان بیت مسکوک ساکتے میرز دا بیت is inscribed on the point زی نورس مور عادل خان شاہی جگت گرو داد الہی the text inscribed on the point اس شنیدہ نے ان سکی شگفتگی حق کردن حیرانم کے من خزوینی کاجمج مراہم و عطفت زبان آن پادشاہ میروان نکتے دام را بے خودام زبان و بیان بے جہد استداد و استبیان شر نمائے دی بے نو دے سلطان حضیر شواز نون ایس جگت گرو پی اسد بے جورنگ اسٹے وین جورنگ اس کنورسیشن وی سلطان تول دیٹ وی بوت ہر گرو بھائی دا گرو دین ہی نیم دا اکبر این میڈ ہمسل گرو بھائی وائل آدھر شاہ واز نون ایس جگت گرو Prior to the demise of Akbar, Asad Beg was given second assignment to. He set forth again to Bijapur, but he had reached Ujjain. Then the news of Akbar reached to him, and so the news of ascension of Jangi too. Asad reports that many others who were on their assignments to a Deccan, especially certain musicians whom Akbar had asked to accompany Asad Beg to go to Sultan Adil Shah to learn the musical uh, notes from Sultan and Adil Shah, all of them on learning about the demise of Akbar without informing him rushed back to Agra without caring for their assigned duties but he kept on his way and concluded the text, text uh, concluded the task but does not provide much detail only detail we get that Jahangir asked where Asad is, again the Sultan mm -hmm. and then his uh, favorable nobles explained that he was sent to that. And then he asked, who said? Then told that Akbar had sent to him. Why he was sent then all others have been, why he has gone? Then the musicians are here. And again a special farman was scribed for him. Same Uzuk was put and it was sent to him. And he was in Bijapur at that time. And then he quotes the whole text again showing that what kind of the special forman was sent and he comes back to the court. Once Jangir was enthroned, Asad Bik fell from grace. According to him, it may be due to his association with Abul Fazl. In his divan, he showers a number of times elogies on the new emperor seeking royal favors. Verses of Saki Nama, quoted by author of Saskrai Mekhana, writes his desire to get entry into the court of Jangir. It appears from these verses that in early period, as he indicated in his present work also, could not get favors from Jahangir. And Saki Nama, along with praise, showed on him, he says, Jahangir, Ansha, Badad, Udin, Kichun, Unnadar, Jahan, Afrin, Khudara, Agar, Rasm, Rude, Sohan, Nahustin, Be, Namash, Gashude, Be, Har, Nuthke, An, Nam, Burdan, Khadas, Sazawar, Namash, Zaban, Khadas, and so on, we can continue. He even composes Eulogy on Noor Jahan, especially depicts the event when Noor Jahan shooted a lion. The painting of that event is available in Rampur Radha Library. I have published that painting in this one and the text from his Divan, which is again on the same event. Interesting, the painting in the Rampur, the Divan is in British Library. <laughs> painting 
may not have fed in the hands of the British officers, only the Diwan would have been, so it reached to British library, at least preserved over there. According to other sources, in Shah Jahan's time he received the title of Peshaw Khan. He expired in 1639 in Agra. In those days he mostly remained engaged in composing the elogies in praise of Hazrat Ibn Rayat Panah, that is Hazrat Ali. The other case of the same, yeah, this was the text of Kaya Sadiq Khazrini. I have just briefly gave this citation, but better to read this text. <laughs> One can enjoy more than in this brief way. Since then, use the language, uh, as we were discussing yesterday about uh, Burmese one, uh, it's difficult to translate basically, because uh, every word has different connotation. How do you we, uh, see the sarcasm in the word itself, then one can enjoy. The other case of the similar description is Shakir. It's the 18th century, that was from 17th time. A member of the elite family of Ansari of Panipat, when my time over, please tell me. I think we've got time now. Hmm? We have got time. Okay. Now, ten minutes. Yeah. Who migrated from Herat in the time of Balban? Imagine a family continued from Balban, even till today, family members are there. I hope you have heard the name of Shada Dima Bali. This is the family from that name. But his jagged comfort upon uh, Muhammad Shah was withdrawn and his services were placed under suspension. It is interesting to mention that the family is still having descendants in Patna. Shakir Khan, son of Rutullah Khan Sadiq, head of the administration of Delhi during rule of Muhammad Shah at the time of Nadir Shah's invasion. Shakir Khan's encyclopedic source of Gulshan Sadiq or Hadikaya Hadik speaks about his time, his family's history, and the history of the time of his predecessors, family who claims to be basically a Sufi tradition, living in the township of Panipat. Certain uh, sources like Ayamai Ansar of Panipat uh, is also highlighting about their family. A city known for Abu Guwari Shah Kalandar Panipati rose to prominence from the time of Shah Jahan. Shakir Khan is suspended Jagirdar records variety of subjects in the encyclopedic work, self-projection as a protective child to a minor loved by Emperor Muhammad Shah or his elite grandees, but the same Muhammad Shah whom he criticized also. In the narration of the events and recording of the information on different traditional subjects as shifted out from available sources, comments continue to project the writer as a man of knowledge of different subjects. Reading of the text definitely provides also the impression that there were sources on the different subjects in the position of the writer. It reminds the recording on the fly leaves of many Eastern manuscripts. Mainly I noticed on the Persian manuscript detail on the detail uh, on the family of the possessor or the possessor himself with his seal or some notes. Recording of the invocation to save the book from moat or uh, kaj vikaj uh, to, to, uh, and from the thieves of the book or seeking guarantee from the borrower of the <coughs> paper was definitely scarcely available, so the book became very much costly to the possessor, and that's why he writes all these kind of a words to get his book back. So let's talk about Shakir Khan on the basis of uh, his work. Uh, known as Goshen Sadiq. I mentioned the work has not been edited till now. Khudabaksh Oriental Public Library, Patna published uh, my lecture, uh, which I delivered as their annual special lecture in 2020. In some way, I thank COVID. In a state of solitary confinement in Tashkent, I was able to read some manuscripts, including this one, which I got during my visit to British Library of Khudabaksh Library. Describing his lineage to project, that is a usual proverb, Pidram Sultanbur, or I belong to royal <coughs> family and have great links, Shakir Khan too tells us that his ancestors migrated from Greater Khorasan to Herat during the time of onslaught of Chandis Khan. Shakir Khan uh, mentions about Hazrat 
uh, Qazi Ali, who was from the Shamruk tribe, but also had that Yeah, but also add, they were from family of Ansaris and their whole family genealogical, uh, according to the genealogical <coughs> tree, is from Abu Tarab Ansari. That, though in a specific place is mentioned, but it seems the family was from Turani group. As in the course of detail on Shakir Khan's unsuccessful efforts to get back the confiscated Jagir and wealth of his father, he quoted regarding the behavior of the emperor, whom he mentioned earlier that Muhammad Shah used to keep him in the court, used to sit with him and gossip. But on getting his Jagi confiscated, he mentioned, Firdos Aranga Hamas Turaniyan Saaf Dil Nebude. The Muhammad Shah was not much favorable to the Turani nobility. Similarly, he also criticized Khorasanis who imprisoned Shah Jahan saying, Vakti ke Khurasaniya ne namakharan sahib karane sanira zindani na hoja. After some time, his ancestors who moved towards Hindustan in the time of Balban, Khaja, Malik, his ancestors settled in Panipat at the same time. It was the time when Dual Isha Kalandar was alive. Despite his popularity in the said city, there were his opponents too. According to Abdul Haq Muhaddis, there we, in Akbarul Akhyar, he is the only Indian Sufi who met Maulana Rum at the court of Balban, the renowned Mosib, head of the moral policing, Tsunami. There were three renowned tsunamis in that time, according to Chahar Gulshan. He was very strict in imposing Sharia and did not allow Sufis to overrule any against Sharia to give any dominance to Tariqat. In Panipat, a group of guns were against Goli Shah Kalinda Panipati. They reported anti sharia activities to the royal court. The said Mosseb went once to Panipat. He became enraged to see the long weird beard, not in Islamic way. Bohri Shah Kalandar was giving sermon at that time. There was a large gathering at that time, but the renowned Mosseb Tsunami of Balban's court went with a Caesar to the stage, pulled the beard of Bohri Shah Kalandar and cut it with a scissor. There became a commotion in the assembly. On seeing this act of Mosib, Bhuri Shakalanda did not object on this act of Mosib. Rather, he asked his followers not to react. He just said, today, Sharia dominated on Tariqa. In this whole text, he mostly project the renowned family of the Sufis who turned to the court from Shah Jahan's time and then on the basis of their noble lineage, every one of them was given someone. Lutfullah Khan Sadiq had seven sons. The renowned among them was Inayat Khan Rasik, who had even prepared some, uh, some sources on drafting of the Insha letters and these are in British Library. There is another Tazkara Mughaniya Nehin, published by Fadavash Library, and Shakir Khan's another book, which is basically a uh, kind of a brief a detail taken out from this Gulshan Sadi, known as Tariq Shakir Khani, uh, to which uh, our renowned uh, you know, Professor uh, Malik Saab, who wrote uh, Mama Shah, uh, history of Mama Shah's period, mentioned that it is a source of no relevance. <laughs> but had he seen that the source has come, I'm not criticizing him, I'm sorry, he was a very rare teacher of me too, but uh, in his presence I had to, sir, please, had you seen this Gulshan Sadiq also? Because really it is an encyclopedia work. Imagine the available manuscript having 600 folios. The contents in the beginning, which gives it gives the 1120 folios, so half is still missing, and the, some portion of it has the all detail of all the 
entertainment ladies of Delhi is a list of it. All the nobility, everyone is there. This portion, he again and again mentioned from his upbringing to the highest position about not only his father's side, then he starts his mother's side. That what is the lineage of his mother? How uh, many grandees were from that family? And even he mentions that every lady was educated in that family. That is means from women's studies perspective today. And then he mentioned what kind of the marriages used to take place. Even uh, like uh, this uh, genealogical studies, uh, Elul Ansab, he gives the complete uh, detail of the offspring of every uh, his brother, his cousin, and more important, he gives the description of both Nadir Shah and uh, Shah Dari's invasion on Delhi. He mentioned that each and every Haveli of Panipat was destroyed to take out the wooden logs to be placed in the bunkers in Panipat. And when these uh, Haveli fell short for the, then they moved towards Badli, Sonipat and reaching to uh, outskirts of Delhi. And these were again uh, sent back to the battleground of Panipat. And from there he rushed with his all uh, family members to Delhi. In Kashmiri Gate area, even today, the mosque and the madrasa of Lutrullah Khan Sadiq is there. And these are functional even today. The families are still there. They said in Patna, families of uh, his uh, predecessors are still there. He gives a then complete detail of Delhi, how the buildings were demolished, how the, the hidden treasures in the walls were taken out, and then taking only few members. And he says sorry to other family members that he is not able to take them. First goes to Banaras, stays for some time, and then reaches to Azimabad, which was his Jagi. But his Jagi was taken over by his cousins. Then he gives complete abusive language. Uh, description about them. And then again he says that they should know that who am I? And gives a complete detail. But who am I? Pedram Sultan was not accepted by his own cousin. They said we are also from the same place. So the description goes on. It depends on us how much material we take it out for our students. Thanks a lot to be with I'll just, um, I'll just start us off asking a quick question while everybody else is thinking about their questions. Um, I learned that line from someone in this room. But, um, so the question I have is, it seems that there are two different kinds of self-protection in these texts. You know, one, you have someone writing at the beginning of the Mughal Empire, in a sense, and he is really keen to show his proximity to the emperor. And then you have a kind of description from the end of the empire, where actually it's not about proximity to the emperor. So, no, I have not read in fact. No, but, but yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is that for him, he's actually emphasizing the antiquity of his family and their like deep location in India and all of the you know great qualities of his family. But actually, you know, and I've also, you know, looking at this text, see that he has frequently very critical comments about Muhammad Shah. And fundamentally, the text is not really oriented around Muhammad Shah. You are rightly observed that one is single person, the other is a group. Yeah. But the other which is a representing the group, telling about the family, at many places when he talks about his childhood and tells them how his father has a close proximity to Mahmasha, he shows that in Farabakh's garden, Muhammad Shah used to sit with Shakir Khan and Anayat Khan on the benches which are still today there mm -hmm. and then he used to play with them. This is the way Shakir Khan is projecting himself having so much proximity that as Muhammad Shah has brought up them. Mm -hmm. But then he also accuses the same Muhammad Shah to be not in the favor 
of them, but in the favor of uh, Turanian or the Khorasanians. Mm -hmm. So main thing is that agreed that one is the gentleman, single one, about whom we do not know what is more. But he is also showing that he is related to Jafar Khan. Mm -hmm. He is related to Nakim Khan. And both are representing him before Akbar and telling that he belongs to a very renowned family. Means the belonging to the family was more important perhaps even today. I think in whichever country you go, all the political parties have certain families who are running the scenario for long. They may keep on shifting the parties like people used to keep on the changing the course. Mm -hmm. So in uh, this one, first one, he is showing himself, his proximity to the king, and finally he could get only the rank of 250. While in the second one, he was a Jagirdar, his Jagir was confiscated. And we know what is the meaning of that confiscation that was. In this one, he completely, he gives a complete picture how when the Jagir is taken by the court, how the forces from the court will come, they will take each and every object of your house. This, this is not your house. This is the state property. And they will throw you out. And then he gives a description for how he was trying to get the Jagir back of his own cousin who was thrown out of the house. Family, uh, ladies are even on the road. And he is running to his own family members who are nobles at the court, but they have some kind of a jealousy for their rise in the past. Now they are not helping. They are taking bribes. From morning to evening he is giving the bribe to take back the Jagir, but every time say, you come at the night, I will discuss with the king. And then he will not be available. And taking already the bribe. <laughs> <laughs> so how to get that back Jagir? is uh, such a difficult task as a <coughs> yeah, piece. So that's a question from Saurabh, I think. Yeah. So uh, how do you evaluate uh, Asad Khan Kazmini as a poet uh, in the kind of Indo-Persian poet in the early you know, 17th century? As a, perhaps Khan Ardu or Saskrab Mehkan, they say that he writes or composes number of verses, but with no deep sense. You read all the, uh, if he was a very popular poet, definitely he would have emerged among the renowned poets. And it was really sheer chance. I was going through the catalog of India of his collection, trying to get some uh, other sources to enrich my this edition. And suddenly I came across to a title, Diwan -e Asad. Means I was not expecting that it will be Diwan -e Asad Kazini. Then I got out the manuscript and it was sheer luck that the, all the eulogies are about every noble whom we want to please. <laughs> Mawad Khan, Nakim Khan, all them. And at least five or six eulogies in praise of Jangir. Only few are in praise of Akbar. Hardly one or two. All are mostly in Jagi. So it seems this poetic collection came after death of all. Even for Abdurrahim Khan Khan, only one or two. So it seems that the Diwan was uh, compiled after death of Akbar to please Jahir to get the, his uh, job back in the court. But we do not know because later on Shah Jahan's time, he got back a job where he was given a title of Pesh Rokha. But majority are from the Jangir and the post Jangir period. Yes.
great people. Like the kind of work, the kind of story he's saying about his own family between Delhi and Patna, is that, can that be seen in similar, uh, in other works by contemporaries or is this a particularly unique 18th century Patna story? Are there more I think families? there are many others also. If, uh, even the sources, if you read from Shah Alam second style, even in the Tarikh-e Shah Alam Giri of Munnalal or the others, because uh, in 18th century, confiscating Jagir has become a system, and uh, many nobles had lost their Jagir, their new. Uh, this is the reason when old Jagirdars had lost their sheen and the new Jagirdars had come and that became a source of a poetic uh, comparison in Sher Ashok. Many who said that, uh, and this is the reason uh, our Zatali had uh, criticized a lot about the new Jagirdari system. There are many verses of these new emerging Jagirdars of that period. Uh, a very small question about the elephant. Chanchal. 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 That's a Sanskrit name, is it not? Or is it Persian? Uh, it's a, definitely a Sanskrit word. So does but that suggest that the Mahouts were uh, Hindus? Or were the elephant handlers at court? Yeah, this is from the Bijapur one, huh. which was sent as the one, and not necessarily, but most of them used to be Mahavat were from that uh, one hmm. community, because all these were professionals, and the professionals continued, uh, especially in the royal course, from the established professional families. Hmm. And in south uh, or in this part of uh, Bijapur side, most of them were from the same Hindu community. Mm -hmm. It is not mentioned in this text, and I hope it must be. Of course, the elephant would not have been sent without the Mahav. Mm. They trained them and so on. Yeah, because uh, uh, he mentioned that uh, there was a fear that uh, because it was not only the single elephant, there were other elephants also. And in fact, uh, horses also, and one horse was given to Asaddeg also, and then he mentioned that the, because if we read in the Asb Namas, the variety of the horses which are given, uh, which is the best one, which used to be, uh, according to some Asb Namas, the black and with the only white uh, foot in fact. So, the, horse which was given to uh, Asad Beg was a tribal one and he didn't like it, but since it was a free, he accepted it. <laughs> 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 but that happy, that elephant, but elephant one. But that one, one was signal, uh, singled out from the yeah. others, like given a name, and probably given a name by the Mahouts who, who, who raised and trained uh, The name was given by Sultan Adil Shah II Achha. himself, and it was his favorite elephant. Chanchal means skittish, yes. kind of, yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, kind of a playful maybe, but uh, unsteady. <laughs> but uh, it is interesting that there are still the paintings of this elephant, huh. and as he describes in this Asad one, that there was an elephant fight which Akbar used to like, and uh, the day he, in fact, uh, died, it was only due to the seeing the elephant fight and he became very uh, enthusiastic during the fight and uh, he was quite uh, heavy also and then uh, had breathing problem according to that. But there, means there may be other uh, versions also, but Asad Dek says that it was due to the uh, elephant fight. Uh, enthusiasm which yeah, and which Chanchal was involved <laughs> and he says I mean sarcastically that Sultan Adil Shah sent this one so
so that the Akbar had died. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have several questions. Um, let's do Daniel in the back. Do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, just to answer, since I'm, you were talking about self and you talk about how families are kind of like, you know, they are constantly referring to their family and the lineage where it comes from. Uh, but families, I was, I was wondering, how do you see, especially in the later period, because families are also associated with modes of learning, right? Um, the way these um, lineages also carry the tradition along with them. So I was, I was wondering, in this late period, how, how much do you see the question of self, not just around family in terms of the locale where they come from, but also in terms of traditions of learning, which with these families are sometimes associated with, in relation to the question of language um, in the later period. How, how, how does the question of language come into play with how they see themselves, the ascription of self, especially in an Indian environment which is so multilingual? I mean, you're talking about all these accounts which are predominantly in Persian, right? But the later you move into the period, and as the Indian vernaculars are coming into their own, do you see something changing in this ascription of the self? Cool. Look, uh In your department or in your research areas, two people are learning many languages. The reason is to read the variety of sources preserved in variety of the language. Language is not the source of your bread earning in future IT. <laughs> but in past, in India, Language has been the bread earning source. Also the Persian, not the Arabic. Arabic was only for the religious purposes. Definitely Muslims were appointed, Imams were appointed. But uh, I don't think the Muslim was required to have a higher degree for an Arabic house. But as far as the Persian is concerned, Persian became, for a wide range of people, bread earning house. Their taste or passion for the poetry or prose writing was secondary in many cases. Or it was a side one. Like our Mukhlis, it was a side one. But he acquired Persian to become a, a grand noble also. Families who learn Persian, if you, uh, I give you four or five examples. You read Balkrishnan Brahman, Chahar Bahar. Uh, his uh, one manuscript is in National Museum, New Delhi, and some letters which are there. They mention that a person who is learning Persian, Insha, Kush Navisi, and if we also learn Syakat, he will be earning very good. Like today, if you are doing engineering and also doing MBA, then you can get <laughs> Similarly, Bhim Sam Kaya Sinuskaya Dil Gosha specifically mentioned. Now, also remember that there was not a competition only between a Muslim and non-Muslim. There was a much competition of getting a job on the basis of Persian among Hindus. Nuskai Dil Gusha Bhimsam Kaish, his uh, uncle was a great noble at Aurangabad uh, during the period, but he died. By the time Bhimsam was just ready to get the job, but since his uncle died, now no one was caring for him. The another Hindu noble also imagine that there were certain positions for Persian knowing Hindus only without mentioning that reserve, which today we do in India. In that India, the posts were not reserved, but these were reserved, <laughs> as Mr. Nuska Dilmusha says. And then another Hindu <coughs> person knowing, he came in position of his uncle, and <coughs> Bhimsen had to seek <coughs> job at Malwa, coming out from 
Bijap as this Aurangabad. And he gives a full description what kind of the competition is going on. So the families who were knowing Persian, getting salary on that behalf, and especially the Munshis, there is a full cycle, even till recent time they continued. These Munshis later on were taken up by the Britishers. When the Britishers had gone, many of them got jobs in the printing presses which were publishing Urdu books or the Urdu newspapers or the lower posts. Even today, if you go to Tisadari or the other posts in the lower, you will find a word Vasika Navis, the deed writers, still Persian. So, uh, we have two more questions and we're almost out of time. So, uh, Professor Farooq. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. It was extremely interesting. I had a question about uh, Shakir Khan and the position of basically people who are competing against Persian immigrants. So he, you talked about black-hearted Khurasanis who were imprisoned, Shah Jahan, you talked about Sir, or, I'm not talking about no, 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 Shah Jahan, <laughs> but you mentioned, you mentioned in your talk, uh, you know, that Shah Khan has a low opinion of these folks who are coming from outside of India more recently as opposed to his own family that came many centuries before. And I was just wondering, you know, in light of the work of people like Manakia and Tawapoli Tavi and people like that who talk about the rise of a new kind of national identity in the 18th century, one in which someone like Sheikh Azim, for example, ends up in a rivalry with Ghulam uh, Ali Azad al Grami, and they have a rivalry over you know, who's, who has better Persian and who composes better Persian poetry. And Azim feels that he's not appreciated anymore maybe two, three, four generations before he would have been, but now there's no space in India for an immigrant like himself. And I was wondering if there was some way to connect the stories of Shakir Khan and his sense of Indian Muslimness, even though he has an older lineage, with the other stories that are percolating in the larger environment, you know, Sheikh Hazim, but also others. Like, what's this say about the formation of a certain kind of Indian Muslim identity in the 18th century. What does Shafiq Khan's text tell us, in your opinion? Um, is it one of rivalry? Is it one of com How would you describe it? Uh, before coming to this talk, I was sitting with Abhishek and telling him certain things. Much before Hazim, I hope you would have read Abdul Hamid Lahori's preface in his Shah Jahan. This whole uh, lot, whether we call them the Indian convert Muslim or whatever, all this Punjabi lot, Abdul Hamid Lauri, uh, <laughs> and the outburst by Munir Lahori, yeah. who was a uh, Hundvi writer of Shah Jahan's court, stationed at Jaunpur. I think more than five works he compiled on, on his way from Bengal to back. And he says, these Iranians, they can only coin the words. They do not know what is the poetics. We know the poetics. Poetics is in our genes and veins. He refers to Vedas. Interestingly, for many years, many musicologists used to say that the description of Sita from Sita, Amir Khosrow's time till 18th century, whether it's Baspati or whether other who are, who are the renowned musicologists, they mentioned that the Sita was not described in any other source. Uh, after 13th century, we find its description in 18th century. But interestingly, Munir Lahori gives a complete description of sitar, mentioning it is a veena. So this whole road, what Khosrow was trying to establish in Nosipar and Dawlan and Khidr Khani, they are trying to haunt away the Iranian groups. 
Khan Arzu and Hazim joined later on. Uh, so the things already had started. Hazim came to attack on this one. Though he stayed with the Mukhlis also and he tried to pacify him, but out of fear of Nadesha, went away to Banaras. But later on, he also says that uh, all Hindus and uh, everyone is Ram and Lakshman for me. But the Tamil Rafali in which he mentioned and Khan Arzu is there. This is the reason when uh, this uh, Muslim and other sources which Khan Arzu and his all disciples wrote in the lexicography one, they established that linguistically we are much richer. And then added by Bedil, the words he coined, the reason he says Persian words are not enough for depicting many aspects. The same thing which you find in Hakaike Hindi by Bilgarami and in the opening verse on Vishnupad, he says, word is like a sea, meaning we are dropping in the sea. Word is not saying that I'm not accepting it. It is we, the human beings, are closing the words with the meaning which we have the perspective that it can fit in it. So Persian has a limited scope of the meaning, but Bilgrami and others, Khan Arzu, they say no, we can explain it. So they expanded it Persian and they used to tell Iranians that you are only making certain words, we are creating the meanings. So this is how and that's why in Logat Nama, the first volume, there are at least three or four articles in which uh, certain Iranian scholars have said that uh, <laughs> uh, during one of my lectures at Parangistan, I told them in my lecture that look, you remove that Persian was once in India. What do you have? If Persian had not gone to India and the huge corpus with India has created, what do you have with you? Only 35,000 manuscripts. <laughs> Our three libraries have. Khodavaksh, <laughs> Rampur, and National Museum. You count these three, this will be more than the one. But what is the phenomenon? that every Persian writing is presumed that this is Iranian's heritage. So definitely there was a huge kind of a literary kind of a fighting among them and the result was a good number of lexicons on them. We see from the positive point if they had not, we had not got the Bahar Ajam, Sirajul Lugat, and others. So, and or otherwise, kindly give me any example of such lexicons in that period from Iran. Yeah. So, thank you. Last question goes to Professor Obra. Oh, okay. well, this was. A question that I want to kind of link up what you said about manuscripts uh, to this idea of self-presentation that you're talking about. I was just curious about, like, you know, it seems like um, you were talking about um, um, the way in which he's making an argument, like, oh, the you know, the emperor is always talking about me and making special formans about me. This, uh, um, uh, as if they, um, he's always making special arguments about me, talking about me. So he's like presenting himself as very close to the emperor. So I'm just wondering when these texts are made, like how many copies of this exist and are these given out to other people to show? Like who's he presenting himself to through these manuscripts and where do these things go? There is not a single manuscript which has any royal seal which can be mentioned as it belongs to any royal library. But surprising still there are five, six. So, five, six manuscripts of a work 
means uh, it kept on changing the hands. The oldest one which is in a very bad uh, handwriting is in Asafir Library. It's very difficult to read it, but somehow uh, I was able to read it out. And the other doubts, the main uh, thing is about the seas and farmers we have mentioned. It gives a description of the variety of the seas and the variety of the farmers. We leave out uh, what he is projecting. But the description shows the administrative functioning of the court, how the farmers were issued variety of the farmers which he mentioned, or the seals he mentioned. And he is mentioning the highest seal, like Uruk one. And then, like in other uh, sources also, we will find uh, the, the seals which were introduced by Jangir itself, the spears one, or the old shaped one. And then uh, the whole genealogical uh, description of from Amir Temur to the one in the so this one mentioned especially about the seals and showing that uh, Farman with this highest seal is sent to him, striped by not a lower monshi but a normal seal. But no manuscript has any kind of a royal seal, though in contents he mentioned the seals. Well, I guess um, on that note, good beyond time. So uh, I think we'll just stop and say thank you for such a rich lecture. With so <laughs> many I just wrote this so